Robbie, what's on your radar today? Well, Brianna, yesterday, Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted the following comment, quote, we need a national divorce. We need to separate by red states and blue states and shrink the federal government. Everyone I talk to says this, from the sick and disgusting woke culture issues shoved down our throats to the Democrats' traitorous America last policies, we are done. Well, that's a strong statement, obviously, and it features a phrase that merits some discussion, as it's loomed increasingly large in conservative and libertarian online discourse recently. That term, of course, is national divorce. Now, this isn't the first time Marjorie Taylor Greene has invoked the concept, and every time she does, she generates controversy. In fact, the New Republic called her seditious for daring to use the term, and progressive uh, host of the Young Turks, Nina Turner, whom we've had on the show, said Greene's rhetoric was treasonous. Now, it's definitely not treasonous, because people absolutely have a First Amendment right to advocate that the U.S. government and the nation itself have different policies or a different structure backing them up. It's no more treasonous to call for a national divorce than it is to say the Electoral College or the Senate should be abolished, which are both popular opinions in some progressive circles. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So what is national divorce? This is an idea that's been floating around conservative online circles for a while now. Simply put, it's the idea that the U.S. is hopelessly divided between red and blue America. There's so much that Team Red and Team Blue just can't agree on, from what precautions to take during a pandemic, what curriculum kids should learn in school, whether civilians should own guns, when light begins, and on and on and on. Rather than engaging in constant, zero-sum political battles in which the winning tribe forces its will on the losing tribe, what if red and blue America simply split up, divorced? Now, obviously, people shouldn't stay in marriages that make them miserable. If Team Red and Team Blue want to live under fundamentally different paradigms, shouldn't they go their separate ways? And while these days it's mostly Team Red wanting a divorce from Team Blue, liberals and progressives should feel drawn to the concept, at least abstractly, if conservatives, if conservative Americans want Donald Trump so badly, let them have him. Let someone else govern Team Blue. Now, the devil's in the details, of course, because the process of decoupling two American tribes would be inherently messy. In fact, it's practically impossible. After all, there are a lot of Democrats living in Republican-controlled areas and Republicans living in Democratic-majority areas. There are blue cities inside red states, and there are red neighborhoods inside blue cities. Should every county in America be its own country? Would that be liberty-enhancing on net if hundreds of mini-fiefdoms had their own border policies, their own currencies? What about Americans who don't hold views that neatly sort into red America or blue America? National divorce has some appeal among many libertarians, but as a libertarian myself, I don't feel particularly drawn to choose a side, an issue that Zach Weissmuller, my colleague at the libertarian publication Reason Magazine, often raises when he's discussed this issue in the past. In fact, Zach is so knowledgeable here that I've invited him to join us today to further explore whether national divorce is a helpful framing for advancing the ideas of individual liberty. Welcome, Zach. Thanks, Robbie. So uh, you did a great debate on this subject with Dave Smith, uh, who's a libertarian uh, comedian and podcaster and commentator. And you took the view, a view I'm drawn to, that this is maybe the wrong word to describe. Like, it's a harsh word. It's an unpleasant subject. Yeah. Even if, when it's necessary, divorce isn't a, a fun thing. So I'm like, well, why did we choose this framing? Even if like, we like the underlying concept, why is this the right way to describe it? But um, why, why don't you give us some of your thoughts on the subject? Well, yeah, the type of tweet that Marjorie Taylor Greene put out there, it really exemplifies my problem with the rhetoric of national divorce. It falsely divides Americans into these two hostile tribes, Team Red and Team Blue, and those two tribes just so happen to align with the bases of the two major political parties. And I, like you, stand outside of that false dichotomy, and actually so do most Americans. If you look at public opinion polling, if you look at partisan affiliation, which is, you know a lot of people are disaffiliating, the rise of independence has been a trend for over a decade. And if you just talk to normal people who aren't ensconced in either the DC bubble or kind of obsessively keeping up with the current political discourse day by day online or glued to cable news for hours every night. Um, you know, what I do agree with uh, is that we live in a very big diverse country with communities who coalesce around very different sets of values and that it's a huge and concerning uh, problem that our two political parties are like competing to seize the levers of federal power to force their social agenda on 330 million Americans. Um, I just think 
a different means of political decentralization, not this dramatic national divorce between Team Red and Team Blue uh, is the antidote to that. You know, something else that uh, Nina Turner tweeted out in the context of the Marjorie Taylor Greene tweet is that there are no red states or blue states, simply states ruled in different ways by the wealthy and connected. We don't need a national divorce. We need class solidarity. What do you make about the left argument that a lot of these, you know, blue-red issues, including the focus on some of these culture issues, something that the, the left, the liberals have historically done, as well as conservatives, uh, arguably to distract from the overwhelming um, consensus among working-class people about what, would, what needs to be done on an economic basis. What do you say about the argument that we need more of that, more class solidarity to resolve the tensions that are brewing in this country? Uh, I mean, I think there's there's some truth to the idea that, you know, class is, is um, underemphasized in American politics. Uh, I, I don't know if it is you know, there's some grand distraction, and, and that's what, you know, the divisive rhetoric is. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of class is shifting, uh, you, you know, who, who kind of appeals to which class is has certainly shifted uh, since the rise of Donald Trump. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there there's something to that analysis, even though I'm, you know, certainly not an advocate of class warfare or really, any, you know, putting Americans into any sort of hard and fast groups that uh, create this this political tension uh, solely, I see, for the purpose of um, partisan advantage. So many working class people and folks on the left say, unfortunately, the class war has already started and it's being waged by the rich. When you see billionaires, oligarchs r routinely run for office and, in the case of Donald Trump, win, uh, and then do things like implement uh, tax plans that overwhelmingly benefit the top fraction of 1 percent of people in the country. Uh, when you see over the last 30 years or so, 40, 50 years or so, the share of wealth that is produced by the working people in this country disproportionately go to wealthy folks. And when you look at East Palestine, you see the consequence of that kind of behavior, where unions, mm -hmm. working people have fewer and fewer rights. They're unable to advocate for the time off that might have helped them to be uh, m uh, better able to check and secure trains like this, uh, lobbying groups who, because of their enormous wealth, are able to lobby to not install safer brake systems that lead to crises like this. Um, and you see a thousand derailments of this sort happen over the course of a year. They say, well, this is, this is what a class war has wrought, uh, that the interests of working people have been uh, um, deprioritized in favor of a raw pursuit of wealth capture for elites, you know, and then that it's time to balance the tables and say, let's start fighting back in this class war. I think that, unfortunately, what does happen is as the size and power of the state grows, particularly, you know, a federal state that, uh, you know, has power over 330 million people, that it's necessarily the case that the more powerful than money interests are better at forging alliances with that state. And that's the kind of critique that that I have, uh, you know, more sympathy for, and, and I think has uh, been borne out by history. Is that uh, you know the, the larger the state and more distant from the people that the state grows, uh, the more uh, subject it is to the the rise of this sort of uh, sick corporatism that I think, you know, both the populists on the right and the left are reacting to, even though I have some disagreements to uh, w with their proposed solutions. To um, Turning back to the national divorce terminology for a minute, one of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with who maybe like it abstractly, what, you know, what, what do we do, how do we resolve the issue when, you know, it, it, ideally you have government at a more local level? I think, I think yeah. everyone at least idealized thinks that would be better. But then what if the local government or authority ends up doing something that is liberty depriving that would be prohibited by some bigger government. Obviously, you know, the case where a, a bigger, more, you know, the federal government is doing something that is liberty negating that, that, a, a, that, a, that a state or a city or a town or something wouldn't want done, that's a very easy case to go, oh yeah, well this is why we don't like big government. This is why we don't like distant federal government. But when you have the opposite case, you know, as you did with 
you know, various uh, in the wake of the Civil War and, and uh, it, it, you know, trying to stop racial discrimination and hiring and all that stuff being done at the federal mm -hmm. level. So that, that's why, and, and I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that we would just let, I mean, this is what we argue about. Do, do other states get to have rules that are, you know, less liberty enhancing than another state? It, it, that's the whole, that's the whole debate, really. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I believe that libertarianism or classical liberalism, if you want to be more precise, is actually the American tradition. Uh, and this is why I am not on board with the national divorce. You know, the, it's baked into the founding documents uh, that uh, the, the purpose of the federal government, uh, according to the, the very founders of the country, is basically that the government's there to protect, you know, our individual rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property, and um, to abandon that uh, is going to open uh, local and state governments to exactly that sort of authoritarianism that, that you're worried about, uh, Robbie. And you're right, there was obviously this debate uh, post-Civil War, and we had the 14th Amendment that incorporated the Bill of Rights. So the states also had to respect individual rights. And I think that was a libertarian win. And I don't think it's something that uh, those of us who care about individual liberty want to abandon. What, what I would advocate for a real decentralist movement is just to embrace real federalism instead of calling for a breakup. You know, we have examples of this. There's drug legalization where California and the West Coast states went ahead and said, we are just going to not enforce federal drug laws anymore. There's immigration sanctuary cities. There's methods like suing the federal government when you feel like they're overreaching or, uh, the, you know, the real taboo for state governments turning down money from the federal government because that's how they control the governing decisions at the local and state level. So these are all more realistic and palatable and less likely to be disastrous methods of uh, achieving the, the kind of decentralization that I think interests both of us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a le very legitimate concern. I think everyone's very concerned about the, that balance. And, and I asked uh, some constitutional lawyers on uh, my own podcast about a year ago to discuss this. What was so interesting is that one, one gentleman said, uh, Harvard professor Nico Bowie, that when you actually go through Supreme Court cases and look at the ratio, the, the instances in which the federal government has been more constrictive in its, in its rights than what the state governments would provide, it almost never happens. And so this, I mean, to your point about how incorporating the, four, the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment was this kind of libertarian rights protecting, rights expanding move, that the concern mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that the, the federal government is going to be the one doing the overreach and the state governments are going to need protection from that somehow is actually really overstated. And some of the worst, the worst Supreme Court cases that we look back on with a lot of regret as a country are in the other direction. And on and on, I think this is what a lot of people on the left are concerned about, is that the arguments about states' rights are often states trying to impose more restrictive, more liberty, um, narrowing rules on the population. Uh, and it's the, the federal versus the states is treated as an even Stevens, when the reality is it's a very overwhelmingly one-directional um, kind of authoritarianism. And it's not, in fact, historically. It could be, but historically it has not, in fact, come from the federal government. So really interesting points. And I appreciate you joining us to talk today here on Rising. Thanks. All right, we'll have more Rising for you right after this.